So first of all, many thanks indeed, Carlo, for the invitation to speak. This is a slightly daunting place to speak in. The sort of community I move in is usually in little tiny rooms with 10 people. But this is great fun, and we'll see how it goes. So most of my work and of that of my group involves the nitty-gritty statistics and bioinformatics behind microarrays and sequence analysis and that sort of thing in the world of cancer. And we do this in the UK, Cancer Research UK's Cambridge Research Institute. Um, but rather than tell you about that sort of tedious, nitty-gritty stuff, I'm going to try and say a little bit more about cancer stem cells. And I, I should remind you or warn you that in the title in the book, a crucial piece of punctuation was missing, namely the question mark on the end, which was the purpose of the talk. So first of all, I have a very uninteresting life and have nothing to disclose. And I'll move swiftly on to what I hope I can expose. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about a, a cartoon version of the stem cell hypothesis, cancer stem cell hypothesis, a little bit about the evolutionary biology of cancer in the light of that model, then um, move on to something about how we're trying to address this by a rather indirect molecular technology. I'll illustrate how that's worked in the colorectal cancer setting. It's still ongoing, and I'll tell you why we've got stuck. Um, and then I'll tell you how we're trying to get unstuck by building a little device to measure things more accurately and more plentifully. And then I'll summarize. So this schematic, uh, taken after from, from Rea's paper, essentially, illustrates two simple versions of a stochastic model involving stem cells. In the model on the left, panel A, there is it's a, a picture of a bunch of heterogeneous cancer cells, all of which can proliferate and form new tumors. The idea there is that if all the cancer cells are eliminated, you might be able to cure the tumor. The picture on the right, the competitor in the statistical setting, is a cancer stem cell model in which most of the cells don't uh, keep producing tumor cells. Rather, there are a few of them which variously are yellow, green, and dark green, depending on where you're looking at the monitor, it seems. Anyway, the CSCs are the cancer stem cells, and they have the ability to proliferate and form new tumors, whereas the others have rather little capacity to divide. So to cure cancer in that setting, it is, at least in principle, necessary and sufficient to wipe out all the cancer stem cells. So the question is, how can we distinguish between these two, and what does it tell us if we could? So there have been a number of experimental approaches to this problem. Most of them involve xenografts, or limiting dilution experiments, so in vivo or in vitro experiments. And what they both, both techniques try to do is measure tumor formation capacity. The little schematic at the top uh, takes a bunch of primary human colon cells, colon carcinoma cells, sort, flow sorts them to pick out the CD133 positive cells, and then engrafts them in a mouse and grows that for a while and tries to see whether you get tumor formation. And you can do that in principle serially, and the same thing with the limiting dilution experiments. But what seems to be the case from a number of uh, these papers is that there are a number of interpretation issues about what you're actually seeing as a consequence of these experiments. There are a number of what we might think of as biases involving the environment in which you've made the experiments, how the cells were sorted. It often turns out that the cells aren't all one type, and then it's not so easy to explain how the, tumor, how the uh, things regrew. Re and of course, you're disrupting the tissue completely. So rather than this sort of experiment, we tried, we're thinking about how we might go about this in a more evolutionary setting. And the work I'm going to describe is stuff that is the sort of far downstream end of what Daryl Shibata and I, my colleague at USC, where I work part-time, um, we've been doing for about 15 years. So the idea here is, uh, recapitulates things Carlo has said. The first thing in the evolutionary biology of cancer is that the history of these cells in a tissue is recorded in mutations in their genomes. That's the first premise. It's precisely the premise that's used to, for example, uh, use SNPs to discover how human ancestry has worked and so on. The question is, though, can we recover the history, in our case, the history of the way the tumor was growing, uh, from these mutations? And in particular, can we infer aspects of cancer stem cell dynamics from that? For example, could we distinguish between those two 
toy models, as it were, that I showed at the beginning. So that's our aim. And the question is, how do we go about it? So there are really four things to do. The first is to decide what sort of mutations you're going to measure. The second one is to model the key features of the biological system. In our case, the models will be things that look like those little evolutionary trees I just showed. And then there's a statistical part which tries to connect the model to the mutation data. The key thing here is that these mutation data are a very indirect representation of what's going on in the tumor. So we have to try and connect the, as it were, the statistics back to the biology. And, uh, and hopefully that will allow us to distinguish between um, a number of biological hypotheses. In our case, do we get cancer stem cells or not? And if we do, uh, what sort of uh, predictions do they make? So the first tricky issue is what sort of mutations are you going to measure? This caused us a lot of grief. So we started out by trying to do this using microsatellites, which in the late 90s was pretty much all you could measure easily. And so we looked at lots and lots of CA repeat loci and tried to use those to infer the ancestral history of parts of tumors. But of course, we'd like to now be a little more fancy and upmarket. So if we had infinitely much money and technology that doesn't yet exist, we would do single molecule sequencing, perhaps, of a few million cells from our tumor sampled from different places. Well, that's going to cost about $4.6 billion, and nobody would fund it, even if we could do it. So, of course, the next thing to do would be to try some sort of pooled sequencing experiment or a more focused sequencing experiment. But the fact is these things are still far too expensive to do in practice. What can be done is to look at SNP chip or array-based approaches, in principle at least. But in fact, those are uh, we're actually doing some of these at the moment. But the bit I'm going to focus on is a rather unusual use of methylation patterns. So it was Daryl's observation many, many years ago that the key feature that you're after in, a, in these problems is some sort of marker that changes fast enough to record things that are happening in mitotic division. And one thing which seems to fit that pattern are the CPG methylation events in particular types of CPG island. Now, I should point out now that when, whenever a, a, a sort of computational biologist talks to hardcore molecular biologists, I've lived in a molecular biology department for 30 years, they all get very upset about somebody who's going to use methylation to do anything useful other than to say something about how gene expression is controlled, for example. So here, all you have to think about is methylation patterns as just a way of tagging cells, in a sense, and we're going to use a comparison of the tags in those cells to infer something about their history. So that's the plan. It's not methylation for interesting biological methylation sake, as it were. It's just a technique for getting some data to do the inferences with. So now, th this problem is, uh, in principle, quite elementary. You can do bisulfite sequencing. You can do that on quite grand scales. Um, in the particular problems we look at, we take a few, a small number of CPG islands. They're typically about 250 base pairs long. And we measure the CPG content of those in what is effectively a single cell experiment. In the example on the screen, it shows um, a particular cloning and sequencing strategy. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that um, and a sort of faster way of doing this in a minute. But for now, let's just say a little bit about what it is you would find. So I see my red dot's not going to work, so I don't need a red dot. So imagine looking at the top, the middle one on the top line over there. What you're looking at. Have I got a mouse pointer? Oh, yeah. This one. Thank you. So what you're looking at here is each row corresponds to a number of CPG positions along the molecule we've sequenced. Each separate row is a separate cell. And what you observe here is unmethylated, 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 and so on, methylated, unmethylated. So you get a little tag which is telling you something about what has been going on, we hope, in the evolution of this cell. The idea is to, do, to measure this at a number of such loci in a number of cells in 
crypts or regions taken from a tumor in many different places. And I'll show you the experiment in a minute. So that's the sort of data that you can get from these very simple methylation pattern things. You can imagine that doing this is A, boring, B, not high throughput, and C means you lose your genomics license because you're not generating very much data. I'm going to solve that problem in a minute, I hope. Uh, but for now, that's what you can do relatively simply, albeit rather classically. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we've, our particular interest with Daryl Shibata is in colorectal cancer. So what we've been doing is to take a, a Daryl is a pathologist, he has access to samples, and he uh, samples regions, small glands from different regions within a tumor. Each of these little samples is about, say, two to 10,000 cells. We take them str strategically placed around the tumor mass, and then we do this little sequencing experiment to find out something about some of the cells in each of the little glands. Okay, so that's the idea. And what we would like to be able to do is infer from the molecular variation we see, as measured by these CPGs, um, infer something about what the evolution behind the tumor was. So that's the, that's the plan in bold terms. You can do this in a rather more uh, fancy and painful technique. You can do laser capture microdissection to look at the thing in much closer detail. But in any event, what you will end up with is a collection of these patterns of cells and their methylation patterns collected from different regions of the tumor. So our particular emphasis here is then going to be to use this technique to try to infer something about whether cancer stem cells are driving what's going on or not. So here's the data then, the sort of things we can collect. This is an example from one individual from a large study we did a couple of years ago. I guess that's not me. Um, what, what, you see, what you'll notice here, of course, is indeed more methylation than you might have expected, but the data are the data. They are these sorts of patterns. Now, what we have to do, of course, is connect the, what's going on in the patterns to what's going on in the underlying biology. And that's where some sort of model of tumor growth is needed. And our approach to this so far has been to use cellular POTS models, which are um, reasonably standard examples of interacting particle systems, to say something about this problem. You may ask why you need anything so complicated. Um, in part, that's because by the nature of this question in a tumor, the information is indeed spatial rather than non-spatial, and I'll show you an example of a non-spatial thing in a minute. Um, but what these models do, it's a way of simulating the evolution of a collection of cells. Think of that as the tumor. You can do this in 2D or in three dimensions. Uh, the thing I'll show you in a minute is two-dimensional. And what you model is cell proliferation and membrane deformation, cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, how the cells migrate, clonal evolution, apoptosis, and so on. And in the context of this stem cell problem, uh, you might imagine that any stem cell produces two stem cell offspring with some probability and produces a stem cell and what I call a transit amplifying cell with one minus that chance. And the two models that I showed at the beginning are very boldly separated by how big that parameter P is. If P is one, then everything is a stem cell, and that's the left-hand picture I started with. If P is much smaller than one, there's far fewer stem cells around for the same volume, and that's the cancer stem cell version. So now what we'd like to be able to do is predict what sort of methylation patterns we would see underneath, under both of these models, and then connect what we actually saw to try and deduce which model might be the one that's going on. So in principle, this is quite straightforward. It turns out it's not quite so straightforward in practice just because these processes are quite complicated. So rather than do any sort of mathematical nonsense, I thought it would be easier just to show you what these things do when they evolve. So the picture that's evolving on your screen now is the, can the rare cancer stem cell version. The red cells are the cancer stem cells, the yellow ones are the TA cells, and these are the differentiated tumor cells. And what you're watching, it, the, these are the, the cell sh cells, and you see them splitting and dividing if you watch this very carefully. So that's the sort of thing you would get from 
the, how the cells evolve in a cancer stem cell model. If we look at the left-hand version, get this to go, what you get is the all cancer stem cell model, so all the cells are red, and what the thing does is to grow, as you might have imagined, radially. It looks much more symmetrical in some sense than the other model did. So that's what the underlying cell evolution is looking like. And then the real question is, how do we connect that to what the methylation patterns look like? So the beauty of these models, of any of these sort of agent-based things, is that you can pass information between the cells in here. For example, you can pass on what the methylation states in each of the cells is, because that's just an evolutionary progression of methylation, demethylation down the cell lines, cell lineages. And we can then look and see what those models would look like. So if you look at the picture on the left, on, on the top, or rather, this is the radially growing model that we simulated with all cancer stem cells. And this, and I can't really tell how easy it is to see this, it's very nice on my screen, but you get a lot of um, small radial looking clones of methylation growing out from the center. So that if you were to sample regions in this two dimensional picture as we are mimicking our experiment, then you would be able to distinguish clones in these sort of radial this sort of radial architecture. If on the other hand you look at what happens to the cancer stem cell version, and here is one that's grown for a bit longer, here the little red dots which are going to be difficult to see are the cancer stem cells, the yellow ones are the TA cells and the rest is the rest of the tumor. The methylation patterns you see in that are much different in shape. You see much more physically divided clonal structure of where the mutant lines are. And the idea is that we will be able to connect the, the data we've generated, the methylation patterns sampled from around the tumor, and hopefully distinguish between this sort of model and that one. So it's indirect. It's trying to get at things without complicated experiments, just by inference from an evolutionary principle. It turns out that to do this effectively, you need a lot more data than we can afford to generate, and in fact, a lot more time than the time taken to generate enough data. So what we've been working on is a sort of example of mathematicians gone mad. We've been building a little machine which will produce lots and lots of uh, molecular data in a very cheap manner. So the idea is to replace this clone and sequence technique, which is, as I mentioned, slow, expensive, low throughput, and boring with something which hopefully improves the situation and indeed can be used for many other purposes too. So we've developed this little in-house tool which will produce measurements on about a million single molecules. That is, it'll look at the CPG methylation states across maybe a kilobase of DNA uh, for about 50 pounds. So it's quite cheap to use. If you were to do the same sort of experiment with a 454 machine, it would cost you many tens of thousands of pounds. So there's a difference in techniques here. But of course, our thing is tailor-made for this particular problem, that is to generate short molecular reads. You can think of it as a sort of little sequencing machine which doesn't sequence every base in a sequence. It only sequences the ones you care about. And this uh, is based on, a, as you might imagine, a, some sort of um, bead-based assay. So I can say more about that if anyone's interested. This is a prototype of what the thing looks like. It is, of course, a, uh, nothing like a nice thing in a pretty box. It's just a, a mess of bits of robotics and bits of flow cells and things. Um, but it does produce much, much more data. And what we're now doing is generating data on this particular sort of problem and in a number of collaborations using this tool. Um, if anyone's interested in more details about it, I can tell you a little bit about how it works. Anyway, um, so. Uh, so that's the stage we've got to with our tumor evolution one. We're now running the experiments. Uh, so I can say no more about how this is going to evolve, but I can say what happened in a, a simpler example in which we studied colon crypt dynamics. This problem is a little simpler than the one we were looking at before. It's still about stem cells, but now the architecture is different. So we're now looking at single colon crypts. You can think of these as little cylinders rather than uh, genuinely three-dimensional things, and there are about 2,000 cells in one of these in a single human colon crypt. And the architecture is thought to be stem cells at the bottom, 
transit amplifying cells in a layer above that, and differentiated cells above that. Despite the fact that the architecture is in principle known in some detail, there's an awful lot we don't know about it. In particular, just to make the discussion short now, the number of stem cells that are in such a crypt is not known. Uh, neither is its distribution. Are there typically very few? Are there could there be many? And another thing that's not known about this is the dynamics of stemness. That is, are stem cells, do stem cells inherit their stem cell property by, as it were, the king and queen of England recipe? You get it from your parents. Or do you get it from being in the right place at the right time? That's the spatial version. And what we've done is to compare these two models with the same technology that I've been alluding to. And um, I'll just summarize by a, a very um, simple sort of picture of this. So the idea is to have a model which describes the evolution of the cells in the crypt. Um, it looks very like the simulation I just showed you, but there, this system is in stasis because the number of cells is approximately constant through time. And then the idea is to simulate from one of these now two-dimensional POTS models something about the evolution of the system and then to compare the data with the predictions. So we call this a virtual colon crypt. So the idea is to take the basic biology I just alluded to, turn it into a really a, a question about the evolution of a sheet of cells. That's represented here. At the bottom are stem cells, the TA cells are above it, the differentiated cells above that. We then grow the model, run the model through time, and we follow through the evo whichever evolutionary mechanism we're considering, either the king and queen inheritance model or the one which is spatial, um, what the methylation patterns look like in either of those cases. In this example, here's one which shows what happens to the king and queen stem cell model. You see, just as we did in the radial model before, these regions of clones of the same uh, CPG pattern. And so the idea is then to, for example, estimate or infer something about how many stem cells are in the crypt and to infer something about what, whether one sort of crypt dynamics is more likely than another. So that's what we've been doing, and I'll just talk about one aspect of this. So uh, I believe that uh, cancer stem cell, uh, sorry, uh, stem cells in colon crypts were originally identified by a group working with Bruce Ponder, who happens to be my boss. So he tells me always that there's one. Unfortunately, the model about the sort of king and queen version of this model predicts, in fact, that you have quite a few stem cells in a crypt and that small numbers are extremely unlikely. So what you're looking at here is an example of the output from one of these uh, methods, they're called approximate Bayesian computation, that matches the data with the underlying model. And what it's telling you is the posterior distribution of how many stem cells there are in the crypt given a bunch of these measurements of the type I've showed you, the little black and white patterns. And you see quite clearly, the details don't matter. What matters is only that the broad features. There are rather small chances of having small numbers and much higher chances of having bigger numbers of stem cells. Um, we've since gone on to try and distinguish between the two hypotheses. Is, it, is stem cellness inherited by spatial positioning or by inheritance. And again, we're still generating more data, but it seems as though the model which has, not this one, this is the one for the king and queen inheritance, the one with spatial information in it is much more likely to be what's going on. And in fact, that's subsequently been determined to be the case in mouse crypts, and we're trying to do more experiments to follow this up. So we seem to be catching something of the real biology, at least in this simpler example. Uh, I won't say more about the symmetrical division thing. There are a number of other parameters that one can infer from this sort of process, and we're doing more along those lines at the moment. So finally, to summarize, um, there are many sorts of ways of trying to use evolutionary principles to infer something about biological systems. It is true that these things use models, which of course have a number of assumptions in them, 
but the idea of, is to try and test for robustness of what's going on. And I think we can do this with reasonable fidelity in uh, inferences about somatic cell histories in tumors and in normal tissue. We've got a number of high throughput technologies which allow us to look at the mutational landscape in single cells reasonably well. Um, these are not in the genomic sense genome-wide at all. They are quite narrowly focused and I'm sure as the technologies get better we will get different sorts of and more complicated data to think about. But the idea is that the uh, little bead technology gives us a vast increase in the number of cells we can measure for rather little amounts of money. It's not rather little amounts of effort from my lab, but it's at least getting us the data we need. And that allows us to compare various hypotheses about both stem cells in cancers and in, for example, CRIPS. Uh, it, it's also the case that these technologies produce, and these sort of plans, produce a number of uh, more analytical um, issues which are of some interest to bioinformaticians and computational biologists. Uh, in particular, we have quite stressful experiences with image analysis in these systems, with various sorts of data analysis and with the statistical inference techniques. So the idea of trying to push evolutionary methods into the cancer world has led to a number of interesting mathematical things to think about as well as the other way around. So with that, I'll uh, close and I don't fall over. I'll take questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Simon, um, oh, sorry, Alfonso, please. First. Uh, yeah, so um, very interesting, but I wonder whether your model takes into account the uh, particular features of, uh, of methylation that is that it can, it can be very plastic, and, and so it can change irrespective of DNA replication, yeah. and it may respond to uh, environmental cues. So for instance, I wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, the position uh, in, a, in, a, in a stem cell niche of a certain cell may, uh, may affect its methylation patterns. Ah, so this is, this is the... Uh this is the discussion about, and I was careful to say it, if not loudly enough, that I said we look at methylation patterns in certain CPG regions. These are what evolutionary biologists think of as neutral in some sense. They are measured in regions, for example, not in promoters of genes known to be doing something in the tissue you're looking at. So we actually go to some, quite some length to try to identify such loci using, in fact, 454 experiments. So I appreciate the point completely. It touches on another issue, which is about the adequacy of modeling things in general. That's not, of course, new to this field. That's, in some sense, what statistics is about, trying to do that in a sensible way. And I think we're making progress with that, with the techniques for doing it and for interpreting it and for looking for robustness. But they are serious issues. I agree. Uh, we are testing a... a potential colon carcinogen by seeing whether it induces aberrant crypts in the colon. And what's interesting is that the, the, the crypts occur, they're, they're always classified as aberrant crypt foci, which means a number of adjacent crypts. So presumably somehow the mutation or CPG change has to go over several crypts, not just one. So, so I'm, I might be misinterpreting your problem. So let me explain what our experiment was. We take many crypts from a single individual. Uh, so I'm talking now about the colon crypt part, not the cancer part. Um, so we measure something of the order of 12 crypts per patient. For each of those crypts, we measure with the old technology something like 25 cells per crypt. And the inferences I described, the little red histogram, was based on data of that type. Um, Again, it's only a marker of cell division, in a sense. It's not a marker of interesting biology, deliberately. That's the point. But if we could measure, I mean, if we could do full genome sequencing, for example, of all the cells that I was interested in, we would then have the issue of sorting out the different sorts of signal that we have. There will be lots of selected things. There will be all sorts of things we don't yet understand. Um, so that we're not currently doing but we will eventually. <laughs>
Thank you. But uh, isn't your question about whether the there's a sorry up here on the podium uh, whether there's a whether there's a field effect or whether the crypt is dividing and the aberrant crypt is dividing to form the little pocket of aberrant crypt. So you're you I suppose so. So it would be a field effect then. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, it seems like a field. I mean, I would I would predict a, a crypt division effect that you've got a aberrant a single aberrant crypt that divided a few times to form a little cluster. So we have been actually trying to do the modeling of crypt division. That is quite a challenging problem. And of course, lots of other people are doing it too. But it's, I don't have anything useful to tell you about it yet, but we are trying. <laughs>